Good morning and welcome to another uh, segment of Fertility Speak, Conversations with Experts. Uh, I am Dr. Daniel Stein, a senior partner at Reproductive Medicine Associates of New York, or RMA of New York, uh, one of the nation's premier and most respected fertility practices. I have over 27 years of experience in the field of reproductive endocrinology and infertility. Uh, and uh, I'm proud that my partners, associates, and myself have helped many thousands of couples uh, to achieve parenthood. Today, we're very, very fortunate because I am uh, very pleased to have Dr. Devora Aharon on, who is one of New York City's rising stars in fertility care. Uh, Dr. Aharon is an accomplished physician and researcher, and she continues to contribute very much to the world uh, literature regarding fertility and related issues. So this segment of Fertility Speak Conversations with uh, Experts is called Polycystic Ovary Syndrome and Infertility. So Dr. Aron, welcome and thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Stein. I'm excited to talk all about PCOS today. Awesome. So basically, let's start with some very basics because PCOS is a term that so many people know, but not everybody knows uh, about it uh, in detail, especially many patients who are first given the diagnosis. So basically, what is polycystic ovary syndrome or PCOS, and how prevalent is it? So polycystic ovary syndrome or PCOS is extremely common. Um, you know, it's one of the most common conditions affecting reproductive age women. It affects probably maybe up to about 10% of women. Many women are undiagnosed, uh, you know, who have PCOS. And it's really, it's a syndrome and it looks very different on different people. There's multiple um, different signs and symptoms that can be associated with PCOS. And, um, you know, on two different people, it can look really different. Um, you know, it's a syndrome associated with various hormonal irregularities involving reproductive hormones, metabolic hormones, um, and, you know, can affect the menstrual cycle, physical appearance, and also uh, fertility. And, you know, there's certain criteria that we use to diagnose PCOS. Um, and again, different people can have different criteria. So, so if somebody's out there and they're wondering if they have PCOS, what might give them that suspicion? What what kind of things might somebody present with that would say, okay, listen, maybe I have this PCOS thing. Let me find yeah. out from my doctor if I do. Yeah, so um, some of the most uh, common features are irregular periods um, or not getting a period. Um, and some of the common symptoms can be signs of excess androgens or excess male associated hormones. Um, so like increased acne, facial hair growth um, or hair loss can be some features. PCOS is also associated with um, sometimes difficulty losing weight, um, you know, sometimes um, being at a higher BMI can be associated with metabolic syndrome. Um, and so these are some of the things that people might notice that might clue them into, you know, maybe I should look into this, perhaps this is something that uh, is affecting me. So, and what you said before is definitely true. Um, it's not one size fits all. Uh, people come in with a variety of different symptoms. They may come in with with, as you said, irregular menstrual cycles or infertility, they may come in with excess hair growth along the body or decreased scare, uh, hair growth along the uh, along the head or excess hair growth uh, on the chest or the belly. Uh, but many people just come in because they have irregular periods and they may get the periods, you know, uh, only three times a year or four times a year. So, um, so you're right. I mean, it's it's it it presents in so many different ways. So basically, um, you know. How do you diagnose this? How do you, basically, when a patient comes in and says, okay, tell me, do I or do I not have PCOS? How would you determine that? That's the criteria that we follow, um, and it goes uh, according to a, a, a modified Rotterdam criteria. And so, um, you know, this is the recommended criteria to follow. And there's basically three different criteria. And if a patient has two out of these three criteria, then they meet the diagnosis for PCOS. So one of the criteria is irregular periods or anovulation. So, you know, not ovulating regularly, not getting a regular period. Now these can be longer cycles. Um, so cycles that are six weeks, two months apart, or, you know, not having a period for a few months at a time. So that's one of the criteria. Um, another one is signs or symptoms of excess androgens. Um, so those are some of the symptoms that we talked about with increased acne, hair growth, hair loss from the scalp, 
um, or um, on lab testing, seeing higher testosterone levels, um, higher androgen levels. And so that criteria can actually be diagnosed based on symptoms alone or on um, lab tests. You don't need to have abnormal lab tests in order to meet this criteria. Right. Third criteria is polycystic morphology. Um, now, polycystic morphology is, is a little bit... Um, of, you know, it's a little bit misleading, actually. It's not cysts that we're looking at in the ovary, it's it's follicles in the ovary. Um, and so one way to diagnose this is by doing ultrasound, counting the number of follicles in the ovary. Follicles are little pockets of fluid in the ovary that each contain a single egg. Um, and patients who have a higher follicle count or a larger overall ovarian volume, so, you know, sort of bigger ovaries, um, meet this criteria for PCOS. Um, An AMH or anti-malarian hormone, which is a marker of ovarian reserve and is associated with follicle count, can also potentially be used, um, you know, as, as part of thinking about this criteria. So if somebody meets two out of three of these, then they are, you know, diagnosed with PCOS. And so, again, somebody may have irregular periods and a lot of follicles and have no symptoms of excess uh, androgens and, and meet the criteria, or they might have irregular periods and, um, you know, excess acne, and they would meet the criteria before even doing an ultrasound. And so again, you know, like you said, it's not one size fits all. Exactly. exactly. Okay. No, great. So actually you mentioned up um, the, you mentioned the uh, AMH and, and AMH is something that we've talked a lot about a lot, even in some of the prior segments that we did uh, for this. Um, and we know that AMH is this protein that's produced by those cells that surround the egg within the follicles, the granulosa cells. But what does AMH tell you? Um, you know, wh what kind of AMH level gives you sort of pause and thinking about maybe somebody has PCOS? Do you have to have an elevated AMH level? Um, what Try to make sense of this for us. Yeah. So um, AMH is used as a marker of ovarian reserve or the number of eggs you have because it's produced by those granulosa cells surrounding the eggs. Um, and so it's sort of a, a surrogate marker for, for egg count and it's associated with a higher follicle count, which is one of the diagnostic criteria for PCOS. So we tend to see high AMH levels um, in uh, many patients who have PCOS, especially those who have the PCO morphology, right. um, you know, polycystic appearing ovaries. There's no specific number cutoff for AMH with PCOS. You know, typically it's, I would say it's higher than like at least five to six, but it can kind of vary depending on the assay, depending on, on the age of the patient, you know, um, but it is something that we look at and that, you know, sort of recently has been recommended that it can be considered as part of the diagnostic criteria for PCOS, again, a sort of a surrogate marker for egg count or for follicle count. Um, right. You know, having a high ovarian reserve, a high egg count is not a bad thing. You know, sometimes patients ask if, if this is, you know, sort of bad to have an AMH that's, that's too high. Um, but because of the, you know, the association with PCOS and potentially anovulation and some of the hormonal imbalances that can exist there, um, you know, there can be sort of some, some things real, uh, you know, related to that um, with PCOS. Um, but that's kind of how we think about it as, you know, something that we often see in patients who have PCOS that, that they do have a higher AMH level. Right. Right. And that's a, that's a great point. So, um, and I always tell patients that you don't have to have an elevated AMH level to have PCOS. And um, and that's very, very important. So you can't necessarily rule it out by having a normal AMH level, but a high AMH level. And, and women with PCOS often have levels two or three times higher than women who don't have PCOS. Uh, but a high one certainly is suggestive. Does PCOS really pose any health risks for women? Um, it can be associated with a variety of health risks. Um, and so, you know, again, these are things that not everyone with PCOS is going to have these things or even necessarily be at risk for all of them. Um, but some uh, health risks that PCOS are associated with is, you know, metabolic syndrome. And so higher risk for diabetes, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease. And so right. it's very important for women with PCOS to be mindful of, you know, lifestyle, um, diet, exercise, uh, another thing that it's associated with is, um, especially in women who are not ovulating regularly over time, 
uh, there's a, ri a higher risk for endometrial cancer. And so that's something to be mindful of um, and, you know, uh, to think about, especially in treating, you know, irregular cycles. Um, and then there's lots of psychological impacts of PCOS. Um, there can be higher rates of anxiety, depression, sleeping right. disorders, eating disorders, um, you know, dermatologic effects. You know, we talked about acne, facial hair growth. So those are some things that can be very, you know, bothersome and um, to women. Uh, and, you know, PCOS can have impacts on fertility. Um, now, not all patients with PCOS have issues with fertility. Some will get pregnant, you know, right away, you know, on their own. Um, but some women do need a little bit more assistance with fertility. And so these are some of the risks that can be associated with PCOS. And again, they're, not all of them are going to affect everybody who has PCOS, but they're things to be mindful of. Right. Uh, and the other thing that we always, some, well, I don't say always, the other thing that we sometimes forget to tell patients is that it's very common to have a family member who has PCOS as well. So to have a sister or a um, mother who has PCOS is very common. It's not certainly not necessary. You don't have to see it. But there's a pretty high percentage of cases in which a, a person with PCOS, a woman with PCOS will have uh, a mother who had PCOS or a sister who has PCOS. Yeah, definitely. Um, you gave a good segue into sort of the fertility aspect of this because we know that PCOS is a very complex disorder. It has very significant metabolic effects for some women, not necessarily for others. And in a future segment, I will be uh, uh, presenting uh, another interview with somebody to specifically talk about the metabolic aspects uh, of PCOS for people who have insulin resistance and diabetes and hypertension and those things. Uh, but today, we want to really concentrate more on the patient who is presenting mainly for fertility reasons. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, some of the things that we can do to help people, even before we get to, let's say, medications. And that one thing, two things I was thinking about was, for the people with PCOS who are overweight or significantly overweight, which is really only maybe about 50 to 60% of the women, it's a very high segment, obviously, of those who, who are of normal weight. Uh, for those women, how effective is, uh, is weight loss uh, and how effective is exercise? So diet and exercise are um, extremely important as far as, you know, overall health um, and, and well-being. And weight loss, you know, in women who are overweight with PCOS, weight loss can help to bring about more frequent and more regular ovulation. Um, and it also can help decrease some of the um, androgen symptoms of PCOS. So weight loss is a really important component. Now, as far as diet and exercise, there's no, you know, sort of one specific diet that's the best. There's no one specific exercise regimen that's the best. You know, with diet, we, we recommend sort of an overall healthy, well-balanced, nutritious diet. Um, you know, there is some evidence that a Mediterranean style diet um, can mm -hmm. help uh, so, you know, high in lean proteins, um, uh, you know, you don't have to cut out all carbohydrates. So, you know, a lot of women with PCOS may, may hear that they're sensitive to carbohydrates, sensitive to sugar, which definitely can be the case. Um, but you want to think about the quality of your carbohydrates, whole grain carbs, trying to avoid, you know, excess sugar, um, uh, you know, highly processed foods. And so these are some of the things to think about with diet. And, uh, you know, again, it's it's really the, you know, weight loss in women who are overweight that we really see more sort of uh, clear changes yeah. in, um, you know, ovulation and symptoms of PCOS. But having a healthy, overall well-balanced diet is beneficial for everybody. Um, as far as exercise, you know, any amount of physical activity is going to be beneficial. Um there is uh, evidence that, you know, a balance of aerobic, you know, more to more, um, uh, you know, uh, cardiac exercise, um, in addition to muscle strengthening exercise, you know, that combination can be really beneficial. Um, and in women who are trying to get pregnant, it will also help um, with health, you know, during and throughout pregnancy, if you are in better shape leading into pregnancy. Yeah, that's a great point, too. It's not just about fertility. It's about maintaining a healthy pregnancy because women with PCOS, particularly those who are overweight with PCOS, are at an increased risk of developing gestational diabetes. So uh, so a lot of these changes have to take place throughout pregnancy. 
And and you're absolutely right about the weight loss. Um, I mean, there are some studies that have shown that as little as five to ten percent uh, weight being lost can restore menstrual periods and reduce testosterone levels in women with PCOS. So I I think that's a that's a really great point. And when it comes to diet, I agree with you 100. Um, percent I think a well balanced diet is the most important thing. But I do tell people to concentrate on the glycemic index of foods because you know, foods that dramatically raise your blood sugar very quickly, raise your insulin levels very quickly, and the high insulin levels can cause more uh, ovarian production of testosterone, which isn't always a very good thing. Um, so yeah, I do tell people to avoid things like simple sugars and syrups and mm -hmm. sodas and, you know, potato chips and things like that and concentrate on the things, you know, like vegetables and meats and things that are much lower in their glycemic index. Let's talk about moving more towards things that people can take uh, as pills, for example. And, and one thing, I, I don't know if you do this, but I want to hear what your thoughts are. Um, I often give patients inositol. Um, and um, and inositol, you know, basically being sort of insulin sensitizers. Um, is that something that you often tell patients to do, or is that something that you feel is beneficial? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, you know, like you said, inositol is, um, can act in the body similar to insulin and so can potentially have, um, you know, a lot of positive impacts in patients with PCOS. There's a lot of studies that have been done that have, um, shown some improvements in different, you know, metabolic parameters. Um, but, you know, the evidence is not that strong. And so, um, you know, what I typically tell patients is that it's something that may help. It seems, that there is, you know, really no harm associated with it. Um, and it can definitely be worth trying. Um, and so I do recommend it, you know, mostly I would say in patients who, who show interest, um, I don't recommend it off the bat necessarily to everyone with PCOS, but I think that it does have the potential, um, to be beneficial and, you know, it's a, it's a supplement, uh, you know, it, I would say it has less side effects than, other, you know, medications like metformin, let's say. Um, and so it can be, uh, you know, beneficial in that sense. One thing to keep in mind with any supplements is that, you know, they're not necessarily regulated um, right. and uh, controlled. So, uh, you know, again, it doesn't seem that there's any harm, but that's always something to keep in mind when, you know, taking supplements. Right, right. Uh, yeah, and I, I actually found that many, many people don't necessarily promote inositols. And I agree with you. Uh, not everything is well-regulated. The data is not always clear, but I see very little downside. And I do think that inositols, you know, they work essentially by, by uh, making insulin a little bit more efficient. Uh, they're more insulin sensitizing. So therefore, the women don't have to make as much insulin, which can be very helpful in creating an environment that's supportive of egg development and supportive of, of, uh, of fertility. Uh, but you're right. Not every not every study has shown necessarily that they are super helpful. But I, there are, have been an, enough studies to show that they can do a good job of making the patient more sensitive to insulin and therefore more efficient at burning sugar. Um, and they can be purchased really in any health food store. Uh, I usually will recommend something which is like a forty to one ratio of myonositol to decaroinositol. Um, but you mentioned, and you have great segues, because you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, metformin. Uh, and metformin is another thing that we use a lot. So what is metformin? Metformin is a medication that is used uh, a lot in patients who have um, insulin resistance, pre-diabetic, you know, diabetes. Um, it helps the body to respond to insulin. It lowers blood sugar levels. Um, and so it can really help with a lot of the uh, metabolic features of PCOS. And it also can help with fertility in patients with PCOS. And so it often will be given um, as sort of adjunctive treatment for fertility. Um, so it's, it's the most effective in patients with PCOS who have insulin resistance um, or who are overweight, uh, you know, but there is potential for benefit, you know, sort of generally. Um, but it's not the most effective as far as fertility treatment, you know, the, um, right. more targeted fertility medications are really much more effective in, um, you know, uh, pregnancy rates and live birth rates, but it again can be used as more of an adjunctive treatment for fertility. Right. Right. So, um, yeah, all good points. It's not a, it's not a particularly effective 
ovulation inducing agent for people who don't ovulate. Um, and, um, but it can, you know, it, you know, it's used as primary use, of course, is for type two diabetics, uh, who are, are trying to gain a uh, good control over their blood sugar, but uh, do not yet need things like insulin. Um, so it can be very helpful, but it has been found to be useful in women with PCOS to make them more sensitive to insulin, therefore help to reduce some of their androgen or testosterone production. Um, but you're right, as, a, as an insulin, as a, an agent to induce ovulation, it's not, it's not the best. Uh, it's not the best for that, but it can still be very helpful. So that does bring us again now to ovulation induction agents. And the two ones that we use most commonly in oral form are uh, letrozole and clomiphene. Um, and, you know, as you know, clomiphene has been used since the mid 1960s, and it was the drug of choice for inducing ovulation until pretty recently, only the last about five years, at which point letrozole now became the drug of choice. So, so what is letrozole and what is clomiphene? How do they work? Letrozole and clomiphene work, um, you know, in sort of a similar way. They, they each work a little bit differently, but they basically cause your brain to perceive less estrogen um, coming from the body. And so to start to produce more FSH or follicle stimulating hormone to cause the ovary to uh, grow um, and develop a follicle that can ovulate. And so they can induce ovulation. Right. Uh, letrozole is, you know, as you mentioned, now the first line uh, drug of choice to induce ovulation in women who are anovulatory, women with PCOS. Um, it's a little bit better at inducing monofollicular growth. So one follicle at a time in these patients where, you know, right. the goal really is just to get them to ovulate one egg at a time. Um, and it's, it was found to be, um, you know, more effective um, than, than Clomid um, in, in uh, large studies. Um, and these drugs can be very effective. You know, studies have shown that, that letrozole can induce ovulation in about 60% of women um, and, uh, you know, get to about 60% pregnancy rates. Um, and so these are drugs that we use very commonly in uh, patients who have PCOS who um, who are not ovulating regularly to induce ovulation. Right, right, and they're both they're both very effective. But as you said, uh, letrozole has been found uh, to be a little bit more effective in inducing ovulation, and clomiphene, and also more likely to get just one follicle produced rather than multiple follicles. So that can potentially help reduce the chance of twins and triplets, which are really very high risk pregnancies. Uh, so it is good to be able to reduce those things. Um, and uh, as you said, they also work a little bit differently, uh, but they can both be very effective. Um, sometimes people will use as the next line, use some injectable hormones. Um, but I'm always worried about those because they can cause so many follicles to grow and you get such a high rate of twins and triplets. Uh, so um, do you use that much? Do you use gonadotropins or FSH and LH hormones directly? In these patients? Not much for ovulation induction. You know, typically we'll we'll start with letrozole, we'll try clomid if the patient is resistant to letrozole. Um, you know, if, if clomid and letrozole are not are not working, uh, you know, then often we'll talk about doing IVF. Um, you know, it is an option to use gonadotropins to induce ovulation, but again, there especially in patients with PCOS, there's really uh, you know pretty high risk of growing multiple follicles at a time and a high risk right. of multiple pregnancy, um, which is a much higher risk pregnancy for mom and for babies. So uh, it's not something that we use often. Um, you know, sometimes we'll consider it in in patients who are uh, truly hypothalamic and for that reason are not responding, you know, not able to respond to letrozole or clomid, um, but always with, you know, a lot of caution and, you know, low dose, low doses of these medications. Got it. Uh, yeah. And, and when you just uh, for the audience, hypothalamic, meaning that your brain isn't stimulating the ovaries uh, very well. Uh, often see that in people who have, uh, who exercise very heavily or who have eating disorders but sometimes it could just be in women who don't have those things. Uh, so sometimes the oral medications won't be effective, but we might use a low dose injectable hormone like what, what we call gonadotropins. Um, absolutely, but I agree with you. I mean, ultimately when you're having intercourse and you're taking injectable hormones um, and you're making lots of follicles, you're, you really have no chance essentially of, of being able to 
I would say you have very limited control over the chance of developing multiple pregnancies. So in vitro fertilization can be very, very effective in women with PCOS who do not respond well to oral medication. And it's much, much safer uh, because you can, we only put a single embryo into the uterus. So your chance of twins goes down dramatically. Um, and, uh, but even then we have to watch out very carefully that patients don't overstimulate and that everything is done safely. I think we really touched upon a lot of the fertility aspects, uh, of PCOS, um, and sort of how we approach it with patients. And thank you, Dr. Aaron. This has actually been very, very helpful. Uh, and, um, as I said, in the future, we'll talk a little bit more about the metabolic aspects of PCOS. Um, which was not really the focus of today, but we always have to consider that. Um, any last last thoughts for the uh, for the audience? You know, um, I think this was a great talk. Uh, I look forward to you know seeing the segment that uh, focuses more on uh, metabolic issues. And thanks so much for having me. It's been a pleasure, and I hope this is helpful to our audience. Thank you. So this concludes another segment of Fertility Speak: Conversations with Experts. Uh, and thank you to Dr. Devora Aharon of uh, Reproductive Medicine Associates of New York. Um, and uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, to email us, but also please click on the buttons below to basically say, hey, I like this segment. And we can therefore continue these segments into the future, which is exactly our goal. So, um, all right, everyone, have a good one. Bye. Bye.